This is Malcolm Rose, and I am streaming DCSS again. This is going to be a little bit different tonight. Uh, this is actually going to be part of a guide for learning DCSS from scratch. Uh, we're going to actually expand my streak today, which I'll talk about more here in a minute. Uh, but basically, if you haven't heard of DCSS, it's called Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. It's a roguelike game. And if you're uh, watching this stream, yes, I am alive, Josh Meyer. What's up, my friend? What's up, Plorple? If you're watching the stream or the video later, um, then you probably are trying to figure out how to play it. Uh, so if you, if you were to go to DungeonCrawlStoneSoup.com, which is a site that I manage, uh, you would see a number of servers that you can, um, you know, a number of online web servers for the game that you can then, uh, you know, navigate to that link, uh, one of those, and then you can see something like what you've got on my screen here, which is, uh, it's called web tiles or, or a uh, DCSS web server, and you can play the game totally online. So while it's possible to download it, you don't have to. Uh, you can play it right in the browser. Hey, Josh Meyer, good to see you too. And uh, Strider as well. <laughs> I am, uh, yeah, uh, it's kind of funny that you that you said, are you alive? I, I haven't streamed in a little while, but that's okay. Uh, I thought I'd get back into it tonight. Uh, I decided to write some guides for the game and so we're, we're doing something, we're going completely from the beginning today. So I'm going to be basically explaining from scratch how to win a really simple combo, probably the simplest combo that there is in this game. Uh, so as you can see, I'm on my Malcolm Rose account. So just to establish credentials, I guess, uh, this is the main account that I play the game on when I'm trying to play for win rate. If you look over here, there's... Uh, so basically... Basically, uh, you, could, you can play any version of the game that you want. I clicked 0.24, and that brought me to this character select screen. Once you're here, there's also a chat box, uh, and there are these info bots that you can send commands to. Um, what this means, what I've done here, it means that I've won 51 games in a row without losing any, uh, which is the world, the world record for the game. So you know you're getting advice from somebody who knows what he's talking about if, you, if you're watching this video later and you're trying to figure out if you're, if you're uh, you know, kidding. <laughs> getting the right information. So what we're going to do is we're going to play, you know, if you, if you look at this, first of all, there's three different categories. There's simple, intermediate, and advanced. Completely ignore this. Th these things are set up in a way that, you know, the intuitive thing would be that you think it means easy, medium, and hard. That's not the case. Sometimes that's the case, but not really. Um, for example, I would say that, uh, well, it's, let's say a halfling. It's a pretty powerful species if you know what you're doing. If you don't, uh, then it's it's not powerful at all. Um, this should probably be somewhere in the middle if it was like an easy, medium, and hard. Instead, this is, I think, supposed to represent sort of how complicated something is to play, and it does an okay job of that. But um, what we're going to be doing today is a Minotaur, which is arguably one of the most powerful races in the entire game. Uh, the, the classic trope in this game that people get pointed towards is to play... Uh, a minotaur, and then for the background, well, that's odd. I guess I'll just press B. It's weird. The mouse wasn't working. Uh, and then, and then what I'll do is I'll pick a berserker for the class. Uh, and just to explain a little bit about these categories before I continue, um, warrior is just melee classes or um, sort of non non caster, non god classes. So, uh, fighter has a shield and a weapon. Gladiator gets a net and a weapon. Uh, monk gets a weapon of choice and also gets piety with a god. I'll explain more about that later. Um, Hunter gets a ranged weapon. Uh, an assassin gets a dagger and some, some needles. And The point is it's all melee stuff. Uh, adventurer is kind of uh, janky classes that are somewhere in between everything else. Um, warrior mage is a hybrid like a, a gish as it's known in D&D. &D. Um, zealots start worshipping a god. And uh, mages start with a book and some spells. We are getting the crawl tutorial today, Herschel. I'm going, I'm going straight up from the very beginning. I'm assuming you know nothing about this game at all. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I am happy to answer anything, and if I miss anything, I would be happy to have you guys let me know. So, we're playing a Berserker today. It says, Berserkers believe in Trog, the magic-hating god of frenzy. Not much can stop a raging Berserker early on, apart from hubris. 
Now, before we actually get into the game proper, some classes have a choice of weapons. Berserker is one of them, given that it's kind of a melee-type start. We could choose a short sword, a mace, a hand axe, a spear, a falchion, and unarmed. Now, first thing you're going to see are these aptitudes. Depending on your species, so my species is Minotaur, you're going to have different aptitudes for different weapons. Minotaurs are just great at just about every kind of weapon. Um, actually, literally every kind of weapon. We are going to go for the classic axe. Um, there are reasons to pick other ones if you wanted to, but uh, axes are really, really reliably fun and powerful, um, especially for, for a minotaur. Now, if you were a merfolk, you would have a really good aptitude for spears and maybe not so good of an aptitude for some of these other weapons. So, you know, it might behoove you to pick the best, the best aptitude the, the weapon that you have the, the highest aptitude in. That's not necessarily always the case, but it's kind of an okay rule of thumb. Um, but we're going to go with axes. Part of that is because axes, unlike any other weapon in the game, will actually attack everything surrounding your character, not just the thing that you swing at. So it's very strong. All right, so finally we're in the game proper. So I'm going to go over a little bit of keyboard stuff to begin with. So this is a very keyboard heavy game, especially if you're playing online rather than the downloadable version. In the downloadable version, you can click more things. Uh, we're pretty much playing entirely with keyboard. Yep, NG Matt, that's right. This is a beginner's guide to crawl. So it's going to be a little bit slower than usual. So sorry if you're looking for some fast play today, but we're just coming straight from the beginning. All right, so if I press um, percentage, then, uh, you know, shift five percentage, I, I get my sort of stat screen. Uh, that shows me the items that I have equipped. It shows me a few different things about my character. Uh, it shows me the god that I'm worshipping, for instance. Usually you don't start with a god, but we start worshipping Trog. We will be sticking with Trog for the whole game. Uh, he, he's a god that hates magic. He um, is basically all about, you know, killing wizards and uh, doing it doing it uh, strictly with martial skill rather than casting any spells. If you were to cast spells or learn any while you were worshipping Trog, he would not be happy about that. Um, so we're not going to do that, which is fine because Minotaurs suck at that. If I press M, that's lowercase m, then I reach my skill screen. Now this is where I think a lot of newer players really get uh, turned off. Is this a multiplayer game? Nope, it is not. Uh, well, sort of. It's single player. Um, you can play it online, but it's still single player. You're not going to run into other people in the dungeon. Um, but you can compare your statistics, you know, for, for instance, your win rate or the different challenges that you've, that you've won. Um, you know, for instance, I have the longest streak in, in the world. Um, then there's also, you know, easier things to do, like, let's say, the polytheist achievement, which is um, if you've won a game with every single, every single god, and this command eventually will pull back the data from the database and tell me whether I'm a polytheist or not. Turns out on this account I actually haven't won on several gods, whoops. But uh, I play for win rate on this account, so typically I don't, um, there are certain gods that I don't go for because they're just not as good. Anyway, so the first thing you want to do, first thing you want to do is you want to press, you want to press M, look at your skills, press slash, if you notice down here, it kind of shows me some of the some of the stuff I can do. That's forward slash. Uh, this this skilling stuff, like I said, is really it can seem really intimidating or really complicated from the start. You know, you have all this crap. If I show actually all the ones in the game, there's even more, and you're like, what the hell does all this mean? Fine. Uh, well, it's actually not that complicated. Uh, what I would suggest that you do. If you're totally new to the game and you're playing a Minotaur Berserker, I would not worry about this too much to begin with. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to put on fighting, armor, dodging, and axes. Okay, uh, one second. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, from this screen, I'm going to press the equals key that says set a skill target. So let me tell you how this works. Uh, Every time you kill a monster in this game, you gain some experience. That lets you level up, but what it also uses that experience for at the same time is it increases every one of these skills that you have selected. You can turn these on, you can turn them off, uh, and you can do that anytime you want to. Um, so you're totally in control of how it is that your skills get, uh, get distributed. 
And so this gives you a lot of granular control over what kind of character you're building. It also means that your background matters a whole lot less than your race because your race determines your aptitude. And the higher this number in the aptitude is, this plus two, plus two, plus two, plus one, uh, the higher that is, the more skill points you get from the experience that you're, that you're gaining. Um, so we have just absolutely amazing aptitudes on account of you know, being a Minotaur. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to press that equals button, that set skill target button, um, and I'm going to hit B for axis, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to put that to 18, and I'll explain why later, um, but for now I'm just going to say that's the sort of prescribed, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, and then I'm also going to, uh, I'm going to press B again, which if I press, um, yeah, if I press exclamation point to change this to training, it'll show me how much, what the percentage distribution is. So notice if I were to like press B a couple times, or I turn it off, right, it goes gray. These are now being trained more. 33% of my experience is going into fighting, 33 is going into armor, 33 is going into dodging. If I turn it back on, 25, 25, 25, 25. Obviously, it adds up to 100. We're going to press B again to highlight this and give it a little more juice. Uh, we're going to take this to 18. And I'll, like I said, I'll explain why we're going to 18 in a minute. Uh, it's just kind of something that it's a little bit of kind of a next level thing that I'd like to get into later. Um, so this is just, just set it up like this and you won't be disappointed for, for the time being. Um, but later on, especially with more complicated characters than a Minotaur Berserker, you're going to be looking at this screen or, or modifying things on it um, a lot more often. It's just, it's uh, one of those things that it's more convenient if you can set it and forget it for most of the game, but uh, it's probably something you want to pay at least a little bit of attention to, even on a character like this at some point. Very bad to do this since he trained. Yeah, Ultraviolet 4, the problem with him is that he, he does this sort of thing on almost every character. I am going to teach you guys the smarter way. Um, and if you watch my street games, which are definitely geared towards players who are not total beginners, you'll see, you'll see me micromanaging my skills an awful lot. Uh, it's, it's meaningful when you do that, but it matters a lot more on a caster. Thankfully, we're not playing a caster today, so it's going uh, to be a little simpler than that. So anyway, our skills are set up, uh, our training is set up anyway, and we can pretty much leave it like this for at least a little while. Um, so let's look, at what, let's look at what we've got. So I'm going to press I. This is my inventory. So we, as a Berserker, we started with a Hand Axe, which is actually not a very good weapon, um, but because we're a Minotaur, it's going to be plenty strong. Animal Skin, which is not good armor at all, same as a robe, really, and a Ration, which uh, there is a food clock in this game, so you, you want to make sure that you uh, don't uh, screw around too much, because otherwise you might starve. Uh, if we press the Carrot button... Um, we can see our status with our god. That's not important right now. Don't worry about that. Uh, more importantly, if I press lowercase a, I see my abilities. And as a, as a troglodyte, as a worshiper of trog, starting out as, as a berserker, I actually get to start with the berserk ability. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this later as I use it. If I use it, um, this is very much a double-edged sword type of ability. It only costs hunger to do, so it doesn't cost piety, which is a resource that builds up when we kill things. Uh, however, if I were to describe this, it says, sends the user into Berserk Rage, going Berserk temporarily increases health, speed, and damage dealt in melee. It will time out quickly outside of combat, but may be extended by multiple kills. While Berserk, almost all other actions than movement and melee combat are prevented. When the rage expires, the user will be briefly slowed and occasionally may even pass out, and will be unable to Berserk again for a short time. So as you can see, it's, it's a very dangerous ability to use because if you are at the end of it and you end up getting, if quote-unquote, pass out, really paralyzed, uh, you can just die as something sort of munches on you, you know, until you're dead. So, um, the way this actually works, this flavor text isn't super specific, right? The way this actually works, and I'll show it off here in a minute, is that if you're not spending actions swinging on a monster, then, uh, well, your Berserk timer is going down super, super, super fast. Knolls are the sole exception to the skill management rule. Yeah, and G Matt, I, I thought about um, doing a Knoll as, as the sort of beginner um, species, and I, th I think that's going to be my next tutorial. I'm going to do a Knoll Fighter, but more about that later. 
so anyway, so we started on this staircase leading out of the dungeon. Um, you know, we're, we're in this dungeon. We're supposed to be going in here to pick up, um, I guess you would call it a MacGuffin called the Orb of Zot. But to do that, we're going to need to have to, uh, we're going to need to learn how to move our guy around. I'm just using the numpad. You know, just the basic uh, 7, 8, 9, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3 keys on, on the right side of your keyboard. Uh, and that, that will just move you around just fine. So I stepped on top of these stones. You know, I saw these stones on the ground. I'm going to press the comma key and pick them up. Every time you see stones in the early game, you should pick them up. I'll explain more about that and why in a moment. Uh, you'll notice that this item has a green little square around it. That's because gold is set to automatically pick up when, you, uh, when there's no monsters or anything around. So all I have to do is step over it, and you see at the bottom in this nice little window, it says you now have eight gold pieces. Now, if I'm ever curious, like let's say I you know, press some buttons and now I can't see like how many stones did I get? Uh, I could go to my inventory and see, or if I actually want to see the rest of this message log, it's been cut off. I press control, I hold control, and then I hit P. And this is my entire message log. Once it gets longer, I can scroll up and down the thing. Really very useful. Okay, so we are going to calmly walk into the darkness and see what trouble we can get into. Now, if I don't want to... Well, hold on a second, let me do this fight. All right, so I stepped up and uh, it says a kobold comes into view, it is wielding a plus zero short sword. Uh, so now we wanna know what this monster is. Anytime you see a monster in this game and you don't know what it is, you haven't seen it before, you're not sure what it can do, what you wanna do is you wanna press the X key and that activates something called, uh, well, is that called map mode? No, it's not. Well, it's a different kind of mode. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's uh, if you press X and then you move, you press the numpad, your character will no longer move around. You can tell because there's this sort of targeting reticule that shows up. I'm pressing X and then pressing escape to get out of it. So I press X, this is up. I know I'm not going to move my character. I can move the numpad around to move this little reticule. I'm going to hover over the kobold. As I do that, it shows me here a kobold wielding a plus zero short sword. Then it says resting. That means he not just hasn't noticed me yet, but he's actually kind of uh, asleep. Uh, more about that later. What I'm going to do is while I'm hovering over him in this mode, I'm going to press V, and that's going to bring up one of the most important menus in the game. Uh, you can basically ignore this text here. It's mostly just for flavor. What we're concerned about is what this guy can do. So we see he has three hit points. We see he has, unfortunately, it doesn't give us his amount of AC or his evasion. Um, we just know that it's... Um, you know, three pips or one pip. Uh, there's parentheses around this because he actually doesn't have any evasion at all right now due to the fact that he's sleeping, but I'm sure he'll wake up soon. Um, you'll see things like it looks easy. I wouldn't pay too much attention to that little descriptor. It will lie to you. Sometimes it'll tell you something is easy, but then it actually is kind of dangerous. Hey, Alf, Good what's evening, up, man? Master Rose. How you doing, my friend? Thank you for the bit. Doing a little bit of a super basic uh, tutorial here today. NG Matt says we should call that examination mode. Okay, that sounds good. Um, okay, so we'll see its intelligence level, which uh, it's kind of higher level play type stuff. You don't really need to uh, know anything about that yet. Same for size, although um, it's certainly these two things impact some stuff in the game, but it's generally not that important. Uh, what really matters, though, is here's the line you care about for things that are not casters. This guy just, all he can do, he can't cast spells. All he can do is hit us with a sword. So what we see is it can hit for up to four damage plus it's plus zero short sword. So here's, here's what you want to do. This is my philosophy for always winning a game of crawl. The number one thing you can do for yourself is you need to know how much damage can the monster do to me per turn. Uh, so this gentleman here has uh, four damage. That's his base damage. And then you add the short sword's base damage. Now, we don't have a short sword in the inventory, but we can look that up with question mark, forward slash, I for item, type short sword, press enter. Now we get to look at the uh, short sword. We looked it up. Base damage six. Okay. Wait, I should probably uh, 
Do that a little slower. Let me highlight that. Base damage six, see? So, look at him again. Four damage plus sword, sword that's actually six damage. Four plus six is 10. Uh, and then there's, um, and again, there's some complicated things about this game because it's, you know, it's a very old open source game which uh, has some curious things. And here's one of those curious things. If a monster has a weapon, you have to subtract two from the maximum amount of damage that it can do. Don't ask me why, that's just the way it works. So it's four plus six from the short sword, minus two. This guy can do eight damage per turn. So we're gonna walk up to him. Uh, actually, we noticed that there is a, there's a bat here. I wanted to run up and swing on him. We're gonna take a step back. Ah, he has stones. Okay. We are going to back into this hallway. So we're pulling away from these dudes. Now let's take a look at this bat. Uh, he's a very easy kind of enemy. He can only do one damage. Obviously he's not wielding a weapon. Uh, his max hit points is only three. Uh, he is extremely fast, which means he takes multiple actions every time I take an action. Uh, and speaking of time, take a look at the top right here. You see 37.0 and then you see 1.0. The 37 is the amount of time I've spent in the dungeon so far. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, this is how much time my last action took. So if I take a step back, that's one turn. Now you'll notice this bat actually did a lot of stuff in that one turn that I moved back on because he is extremely fast. Uh, he hit me but did no damage. My AC did the job of protecting me. Uh, and then he also managed to move backwards because he has, uh, well, bats have what's called batty movement. They move backwards and forwards in, in, in sort of vaguely unpredictable ways. Now, if I want even more information about this bat, you know, it said he's extremely fast, but what does extremely fast mean? I can go into my little info bot here and I can type the at sign and then a question mark and then bat and look that up. I see he's actually speed 30. For, uh, <laughs> for point of reference, um, most monsters are speed 10, so bats are just hilariously quick. I'm gonna go back again. I'm going backwards. Um, now, something really funny happened here. I didn't attack him, but he died. Uh, minotaurs are very unique insofar as if something attacks me, there's a chance every time it attacks me of my horns, which if I if I hold shift and press A, that's capital A, not, not lowercase a for abilities, but instead in it abilities, weirdnesses, and mutations, I can see that I have a pair of horns on my head and I reflexively headbutt those who attack me in melee. So every time I attack, there's a chance that I hit them with my horns, and every time someone attacks me, there's a chance that I do a counterattack, and that's what happened, and the bat dies. So we saw that this guy, he had stones, and he was throwing them at me, right? I don't want him to be able to throw stones at me, so here's your line of sight lesson for the day. Uh, I don't want him to just chuck stones at me as he's coming down, or as I'm coming towards him. What I'm going to do instead, and this is like the crucial, crucial way of taking as little damage as possible. I am going to abuse this wall here. See these rock walls? Uh, I am going to take a step to the top and to the right, up and right, that's the number nine. Now he can't see me. So in this game, line of sight, it's said to be reciprocal. Uh, so that means that if I can't see the monster, the monster cannot see me. It's like you're playing a game of peekaboos, you know, with a baby or something, it's just how it works. So he can't throw stuff at me, he can't do anything to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to now press the 5 key. This is the rest button. It will rest, it will have my character basically do nothing um, until, until the monster or any monster comes into view. Or until 100 turns passes. So I did that. And the kobold is now too close for my liking. He popped into view. I have 17 hit points left. The bat did a little bit of damage to me or maybe the stone did. I didn't quite see. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to swing on him now. We're just going to walk. It's called bumping. We're just going to walk right into him. So I'm pressing the one key right now, down and to the left. I missed him. The kobold hit me with his short sword. Now, I am actually doing something slightly risky right now because uh, even though I'm one of the most powerful races in the game, he can hit me for eight damage. And technically, because I am attacking it over one speed... 1.1 instead of 1.0 because my hand axe is quite slow to start with. Technically, he could get two attacks on me, so this is a little bit risky. But we swing, and we hit him but do no damage. Uh, then we headbutt him, and that misses two. 
Then the kobold misses me. Then I furiously retaliate and I headbutt him in the face and he dies. Very unlikely to just die to a kobold as a uh, minotaur this early in the game. Some races have differences, such as draconians having wings and gargoyles having stone bodies. We'll cover them as they become relevant. Right, yeah, other races do in fact have uh, various little quirks to them. Um, the, the horns thing is unique to minotaurs though. All right, so we're going to press five again, and the reason for that is we're, we're actually pretty hurt, right? Um, I left one thing out, so pressing five will rest until a monster comes close, or a hundred turns have passed, or you heal up. So I pressed five, and you'll see that 56 turns passed, but then my health naturally regenerated back to 20. Um, so there's no reason to rest more than that, so the game stopped me. I could force myself to rest again, and it would rest a hundred turns, but why would I do that? So, we're going to take a step. Uh, we see that the kobold had stones, because you look at the bottom, it says D11 stones gained one. We had already picked up some stones, so they already sort of um, were set to auto-pick up, I guess, to replenish my stock. I go up here, I see the back corpse. We're going to press lowercase c to butcher it. I kind of had it set to auto-butcher, which, which I'll explain in a minute, but uh, I did that manually for now. Um, I don't need to pick it up, I just pressed comma, but I didn't have to because it says there's no objects to be picked up here. You butcher the bat corpse, you get a chunk of flesh, and it just automatically picks it up. And I can't pick up the skeleton. If I press the lowercase e, you know, you might think, okay, so I would like to eat my chunk of flesh now. I press F, it says you aren't quite hungry enough to eat that. Uh, you can only eat raw flesh, you know, non-rations, when your character's pretty hungry, which we aren't yet. All right, so there is a thing in the game. You're probably thinking, well, surely I don't have to press these keys and move manually throughout the entire dungeon, and you do not. You can press the O key. Now, notice how that just instantly took me way over here. That's called auto-travel. It's very dangerous, um, especially in the early game. Less so on a strong character like this, but most characters, you really, if you're trying to play for win rate, if you want to win every game, which is possible for the most part, maybe 99% of games, um, depending on your combo, you, you really don't want to press auto explore because it can move your characters in ways you really wouldn't, really wouldn't like. You'll notice that there is this little trail behind me indicating where the auto explore took me in all those turns. And if you look at the time, it actually walked me 16 tiles. So both of these enemies, it's a bat and a goblin. Both of them are awake. The goblin we see can do four damage. Uh, I don't know why he has pistachio-shaped eyes. That's that's odd. Uh, but he does four damage, and uh, like a kobold, he's really not that dangerous, especially if he doesn't have a weapon. Some of those guys can be very dangerous when they have a weapon in the early game, especially for certain combos, but our minotaur is very stout, very strong, doesn't have a lot to worry about. We're gonna go ahead and swing on the bat. He doesn't, uh, doesn't hit us. I'm gonna back off again. Uh, we're gonna swing, back off again. The idea is that we don't want to we don't want to bite off more than we can chew, do we? We're trying to back off because we don't want too much stuff to show up. All right, so now here's one of those places where those stones come in handy. So this is the F key that I'm pressing, F for fire. You'll notice that I already have the stones showing up in this part of the screen. That means they're quivered, which means they're the thing that'll automatically get thrown if I press the F key. So I press F. And it brings up this sort of targeting reticule. It says throwing I inventory D dash 12 stones. Uh, now, if I were to press enter right here, what it would do is it would throw the stone. And if it missed the goblin, it would actually keep sailing onwards over here and maybe make some noise over there and draw some more enemies. What I want to do instead is make sure that stone drops at his feet, even if it misses him. So instead of pressing enter, I'm going to make sure this is lined up. So I'm going to make sure the targeting reticule is right on top of the goblin. I'm going to press the period key. And you'll notice that the stone missed him, but it still landed far away. Or not far away. Do that again. Misses again. We're not very good at throwing. Now we're just going to swing. We hit him uh, with our headbutt, not with our axe. He hits me, but does no damage. We swing again, and he goes down. Now we're not hurt, so we're just going to auto explore again. Now we have a frilled lizard. Let's take a look at that. One of the biggest things in this game that you want to pay attention to is the speed of monsters, and almost everything we've seen so far, except for bats, has been normal speed. You'll notice it doesn't say that it's fast, it doesn't say that it's slow. That means that it's speed 10, just like you, 
if you're a Minotaur, uh, or almost any race really, except for a couple of quick races, uh, Spriggan and Centaur, and that's it. Uh, everybody else is either speed 10 or lower. That's average speed, same as most monsters. So as a speed 10 guy, uh, I really want to sort of be aware when things can act more often than I'm, than I'm acting. Because otherwise, if something's faster than me, that means I can walk away, but it's still able to attack me, do damage to me, and keep pace with me. So running away from it is not really an option. In this case, though, the Frilled Blizzard is not fast. He only has two hit points. He can bite for three damage. Kind of a joke enemy. But let's pull him back anyway. Let's be conscientious, because we don't want to pull more than we can handle. We throw the stones, and we actually manage to kill him. There's a whip on the ground here, by the way. I'm ignoring it. I ignored the short sword as well that the kobold dropped earlier. Um, that's because, you know, they're not really that interesting compared to the hand axe that we've got. We're going to auto-explore again. Now, certain things are getting automatically picked up. We just picked up a smoky ruby potion. There are unidentified items in this game. It's called the Identification Minigame. If I look in my inventory, I see this thing. If I press E, it just says an unlabeled flask containing a single dose of unknown liquid. We don't know what that is. So until we have a stack of more than one of these, we're not going to mess with it. Auto explore again. We get a different potion. We know that the two potions are different, but again, we don't know what they are. So we're not going to bother with it yet. Hobgoblin shouts. Sometimes when something comes into view, for the first time, or not for the first time, it'll see you and it'll actually make noise. This is a kind of a hint. It's kind of a piece of information because if he had shouted and we had heard more shouts coming back from off screen, like you hear a shout, you hear a hiss, that kind of thing, that gives you an idea of what's behind him and what type of things are behind him, like how many things and, and what type of things. Nothing shouted back, so there's a good chance he's just alone. Nevertheless, we're going to be smart and we're going to back off again into this little hallway where we've been, where we know there are no enemies because this is where we came from. And then we're going to chuck stones at him. And by the way, just to show this off, I'm going to press enter now. Uh, well, that hit him. That hit him. All right, well, I was going to show how it sails past him, but all three stones actually hit him, so never mind. We're going to swing now by walking into him. Just pressed six to walk into him. He leaves a nice edible corpse, although we're not hungry yet. We'll butcher it anyway. And we walk over, pick our stones up. I'm going to auto-explore again. Now we've got a hobgoblin. I guess I should have executed the first hobgoblin to show you guys. They do five damage. Um, this one has a club, which I happen to know. I'm going to look this up the same way. I happen to know it actually does five damage as well. Remember, when a, we when a monster has a weapon, it's the base damage plus the weapon damage minus two. So that's eight damage. Uh, he can do eight damage per turn. He hasn't noticed us yet. So in order to get his attention, I'm going to throw a stone right at his face. It misses, he shouts, we don't hear any more shouts. I'm gonna back off, just in case something wanders by. Don't wanna fight multiple things at once if possible. We swung twice, he hit us once in the process of that, and he went down. Clubs are really bad weapons, we probably don't wanna use it. All right, so we auto explore, uh, and we run into another enemy. This is another one of those goblins, four damage base if you recall. A dagger does six damage base, um, and then so you do four plus six, and then minus two because he has a weapon. This, again, can do uh, eight, eight damage total. However, in modern crawl, uh, if something is cursed or enchanted or anything like that, you actually know about it if you see a monster wielding it. This guy happens to have a cursed minus two dagger. What that means is that uh, it can, but not necessarily will, subtract two from his damage, up to two, one, two, or zero. Uh, that doesn't affect the max damage, so I don't really care. Again, the number one thing about this game is being aware how much damage a thing can do to you. And if it can kill you in the next hit, you probably want to back off. And you may see me doing that here in a minute. There's no reason not to butcher a body if it's edible unless you're playing a necromancer. That is correct, Inji Matt. Well, yeah, no, that is, that is correct. For the most part. There's a couple of weird corner cases. All right, so we auto-explored. We got another potion. It's not one of the three, or one of the two that we had before. We got a scroll. We got another scroll. All of these are just single stacks. You know, there's no duplicates. So we're not going to bother with them for the time being. All right, check this out. This is chainmail. 
There is a chance, I believe, that this could be cursed, meaning we couldn't take it off, but with that said, chainmail is really good. Let's take a look at our animal skin. I'm pressing I, and then I'm pressing B. We see that it has a base armor rating of 2, which is how much AC that it's giving us. Uh, it's also going to give us an idea of how much our armor skill gives us in terms of bonus AC from it. The lower the number, the less extra AC we're going to get. Encumbrance rating of zero, that means that it's not messing with our spell casting at all, nor really messing with our uh, dexterity, or rather our evasion, so heavier armors will make you worse at dodging things. This is total crap. Um, we're going to press capital W, that's hold shift, hit W, and it says, uh, this is this is the wear menu for wearing items. Floor items, comma to select, we're going to press comma. Now we are wearing the chainmail. It's not cursed. Even if it had been cursed, I would have been happy to wear it. So just to put the animal skin back on, we notice that my AC is 2, my evasion is 12. That's up here at the top right. Sorry to move too fast if I am. Uh, AC 2, EV 12, SH of 0. That's shield. We don't have a shield yet. Pop on the chainmail again. So we go to 8 AC and 8 evasion. So we went up by 6 points of AC, and down by 4 points of evasion. I'm going to drop that animal skin. Now, there is a hidden attribute that is not listed on this chainmail, which, by the way, has a base armor rating of 8. Uh, that is called guaranteed damage reduction. Depending on how heavy the armor is, I'm going to bring up the right thing here, um, depending on how heavy the armor is, there is a certain amount of damage that will be guaranteed to be reduced based on your AC if the damage source is melee. So that robe, that animal skin, whatever you want to call it, 0%. It's no GDR. But this chain mail has 34% of your AC is guaranteed to be reduced. So um, basically what this means is I am there is a certain amount of damage that is, that is guaranteed not to hit me. And that's really, really good. I, I assure you that it matters. So we're, especially on this character, we're going for the heavier armor for the most part when we when we find it. Another thing I kind of want to... Well, that's... Never mind. I was going to... Well, okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and explain it. So if I were to press question mark here to get help and go to armor... So this is my skill menu, if you call, right? So I, I pressed M to get here. I pressed question mark. I pressed G for armor. Armor skill increases the AC gained by wearing heavy armor. It also helps lessen the hindrance of heavy armor on melee combat and spellcasting. Um, doesn't really explain how that works, does it? Just says it increases the AC gained by wearing heavy armor. Okay. Well, this little info bot will tell you if I press exclamation point AC. So what was what was the base AC of our chainmail? Eight. Eight. So let's let's see. So if I do, oops, sorry about that. If I do exclamation point AC and then eight, my nice little bot here tells me that it takes 2.75 armor skill for one AC for eight base AC. So what does that mean? What does that actually mean? What that means is if I have eight base armor rating from this chain mail, plus other armor that I'm wearing, uh, what that means is that for every 2.75 armor skill, and I'm almost, I'm almost there, I will get a free point of AC. So, you watch me kill a couple more things, you're going to see this AC get bumped to 9. So, if you're micromanaging your skills, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Certain breakpoints, you know, where your character becomes stronger. Uh, so, let's, let's auto-explore again. Now, this is a cockroach. This is our first enemy that, is, uh, that moves in a non-batty way, you know, in a, in a chase you and kill you kind of way. Uh, that is faster than speed 10. And again, unfortunately, the game doesn't tell you exactly how fast it is. It just says it is fast. It's speed 12. Um, and I think that means he takes maybe an extra action for every four actions you take, something, something along those lines. So... In the beginning of the game, you know, he's still a pretty weak enemy, right? Two damage only, only five hit points. But on weaker starts, this guy can end your whole career. He can end this man's whole career. So 
What you really want to do is be very careful against fast monsters. And if you happen to spot him and he doesn't see you and you're playing some kind of really fragile guy, you might want to hold off until you've leveled up a bit. But our Minotaur can handle one little bug very easily. So we threw our rocks until he was close to us and then we slammed the axe into him and he died very easily. He's also edible. Not that I would really want to eat a giant cockroach. Wait, I want to back off. I'm less interested in doing damage to him with the with the stones and more interested in fighting him in a place where more enemies are not going to show up. So I killed him, I auto-explored again. Uh, we see that we've got another frilled lizard and hobgoblin. Very easy enemies to kill at this point. Now I'd like to point something out real fast. Let's say my dude was hurt. Let's say I had like five hit points for some reason right now. That would be really bad, wouldn't it? But these guys are both speed 10. And this is the reason why speed matters so much in this game. We back off. He can chase us, but he can't catch us. Not really. Sometimes he gets an extra move. Sometimes he gets uh, one less move than he should have gotten. That's called random energy. But for the most part, he just keeps pace with us. So if it was just him... It seems like the lizard has lost us. If it was just him, we could walk around this column, this little area, basically forever. And while I'm doing that, my hit points would be regenerating. Hey, Mr. Ostrom, how you doing? But we don't need to do that. We're not hurt, so we're just going to swing on him. Swing three, swung three times, and he, he died. Killed his friend, too. Easy enough, right? Maybe for streak 52. Yep. This will be the 52nd win in the streak. It's also going to be, this is going to be a video that'll go to YouTube as a, you know, super, super beginners kind of, um, kind of video. I want to try to teach people how to win this game from scratch. So I'm teaching the, the simplest combo that there is. Uh, we just picked up another scroll. So we have three different scrolls and three different potions. Make that four different scrolls. Oh, uh, I don't think I said, I'm pressing the R key in order to see my scrolls, my scrolls only. If I were to press B, I, J, or L, it would actually read one of these scrolls. Those have different effects that we'll get into later. Likewise, if I press Q for quaff, which is a fancy word that means drink, uh, same sort of deal. I could press E, G, or H to drink any one of these potions and something would happen. There's leather armor on the ground. We're not going to pick it up because, um, well, if I were to look up leather armor, the uh, AC is only three, and this character generally wants to have really high AC. Leather armor is not very good. You would use it, you know, if you didn't have anything better, probably. I would have worn that in lieu of my animal skin, but not in lieu of my chainmail. Alrighty, so kind of what I was talking about earlier, the goblin shouts. Then it says, you hear a shout. That's a different shout. So somewhere behind him, there is a goblin a kobold, a hobgoblin, maybe something more dangerous like a knoll even. We know that he's got a buddy behind him. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, you know, play the Benny Hill theme or whatever, yakety sax, and we're going to back off. Uh, I don't want to go up here, do I? Because that's unexplored. We're going to go up the hallway that we've already been down. And this is just really safe play. If you if you wanted to, you could rush right in and kill him. Uh-oh, we've been, we've been surprised. Um... Cobalt kind of showed up here. Things do wander around the level. Now we've got two things to fight. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk up and to the right. We're going to go down and to the left. That'll give him one swing on us, and he missed. We're going to walk over here. In general, if you can fight things in hallways like this, you want to. Even though my axe, if I were to have both of these dudes next to me and I was swinging on them, it would hit both of them because that's what axes do. Even though that's possible... I don't actually want multiple things attacking me at the same time if I can avoid it. So especially in the early game when I'm supposed to be careful, uh, we're going to, you know, play it safe. Now, if I felt overwhelmed, and this is just for example, you, you shouldn't do this unless you're sure. Um, if I felt overwhelmed on this character, remember that Berserk ability that I mentioned? Let's pull these dudes back, way far back, really far back, into an area that's such a dead end that I'm 99% sure nothing is hiding back there. Uh, nothing spawns behind you, by the way, even though it can wander wander there. It's very unlikely something's back here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to show off Berserk. 
not necessary right now, but let's let's just say this was really tough stuff that's definitely going to kill me. Uh, we would say, well, I'm, I'm ready to berserk. So I'm going to press A, then I'm going to press A again. That makes me hungry, a little hungrier anyway. And uh, it's an ability gifted to me from my god Trog that I started with because I'm a berserker. You see this nice, beautiful red overlay because my guy is just so pissed off. It says a red film seems to cover your vision as you go berserk. You feel yourself moving faster. You feel mighty. Um, so my actions are much quicker, and they do way more damage. Also, you'll notice that my hit points went from 27 to 40. Now, if you have played D&D, &D, then that's classic D&D &D stuff. Uh, that, that hit point boost will go away, though, when the Berserk is over. We tab in now, yeah. All right, so we swing, and you'll notice that suddenly, remember this little thing that tells me what my last, how much time the last action took? Suddenly... Um, this is taking less time, 0.8, when really it should be taking 1 or maybe 1.1. Now we're going to take a step up. He attacks um, but does no damage. Moving only took 0 0.6, but if I'm moving, if I'm not attacking, that's very bad for the Berserk. Every single time I take an action that's not swinging, then the Berserk uh, basically is ending, uh, or the timer is going down very rapidly. But we had to do that because we killed the thing and this guy didn't move towards us and we had to get up next to him. So we move into him, again, attacking very quickly, slashing him and just slaughtering him very easily. Now the Berserk is going to end, there's no monsters around. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back into our little hidey hole, back again. You see you feel a strong urge to attack something and if you notice, if you saw right here, this little area where it says Berserk, that's where your effects show up, if you have anything affecting your character, any kind of magical thing, any kind of status effect. The color went from sort of a light blue to a faded blue. That means that the effect is ending. That means that we have an idea that our Berserk is probably going to end in one or two turns. So I moved again, I did not, I did not come out of the Berserk, I moved again, now I am out of the Berserk. Now it says, uh, you feel your anger nearly subside, you are no longer Berserk. You pass out from exhaustion. This is the worst thing that can happen after, after a Berserk. It's less likely to happen when you're worshipping Trog, but it can definitely happen. And every single time you end a Berserk, it says you feel yourself slow down. So we press Enter. You can move again. It took, I guess, 1.7 turns uh, for me to stop being paralyzed. Uh, so there's two things happening right now. We are slow, and we have minus Berserk. Minus Berserk means I can't Berserk again for as long as that's up. And slow means, look if I move. Look what happens if I move. 1.5 speed to move. So I'm moving not half as quickly, but uh, like I think, I guess that would be a quarter. If it was half, it would be two. But um, still, we're, we're getting uh, much less bang for our buck out of our movement. So we really don't want to fight anything or do anything really well slow. So we're just going to... Walk away, walk away, walk into this nice dead end. And after a few turns, it says you feel yourself speed up. The Minus Berserk takes a little longer to wear off, but otherwise, we're fine. Um, Mr. Alstrom mentioned, he said, mention what uh, Berserk, mention that Zerk doesn't extend without truck. Right, um, if you're not a Berserker, there are other ways to trigger the Berserk effect. But as a Berserker, there's a lot of perks, like you're less likely to be paralyzed afterwards. Uh, and if you kill things, you can actually extend the duration of your rage. Berserk is still a very dangerous effect when you're worshipping Trog, uh, but there are certain ways to trigger it on other characters, like I said, uh, such as a potion or a magical weapon that induces a rage. Uh, but you don't get those perks if you're not worshipping Trog. All right, let's auto-explore. A hunting sling. So this is interesting. On many characters, I would pick this up, and I might even consider wearing it. Uh, I pressed comma on it to pick it up. Now here's the reason why I'm not actually going to wear it. Uh, this is, see how this is gray? This has not been identified. It's not green like my chain mail. It's not green like my hand axe. It's, it's, it's gray. A monster wasn't wearing it. So I don't know what this thing is. It could be cursed, which means that I can't take it off until I find a scroll of remove curse. Now, it would be very, very bad, if we were stuck slapping people around in melee with a hunting sling because we ran out of stones. So we're not going to wear that. All right. 
so I've showed you guys the sort of optimal way to back up and lure things and, and only fight one thing at a time. Now I'm going to play a little more free and easy, fast and loose, because this, like I said, is one of the fast, one of the fast, one of the bestest, bestest, <laughs> let me try that sentence again. This is one of the best uh, and most powerful species in the game, and backgrounds for that matter. So we can afford, at least right, right here, to be a little bit reckless. So instead, I'm going to just walk towards this dude and walk towards this dude. So something uh, that Desert7786 said a minute ago, he said, we tabbing now. Uh, and that was a joke. That was a joke in reference to the tab key, um, which is a key that you, if you're playing optimally, you probably shouldn't press too often. But what it does is it automatically moves your character, uh-oh, automatically moves your character towards the nearest enemy in an effort to attack him. Uh, check it out. Leopard Gecko hisses angrily, Hobgoblin shouts. Now here is one of your most dangerous enemies that could show up on the first floor. And the reason for that is that a Leopard Gecko, despite only having 5 hit points and only doing 5 damage, is actually speed 12. So if he attacks twice with his fast speed, that's up to 10 damage. Less for me because I have my nice chainmail with a guaranteed damage reduction, but still a bit dangerous. So here's the trick. I'm going to walk backwards, and I walked backwards until he got a double move on me, which put him next to me. If I instead walked up to him, I'm essentially inviting him to punch me in the face one, maybe two times. But this way, it's guaranteed uh, that I get the first swing. I hit him. He hits me for one damage. I hit him again. I don't do anything. I don't do much. He hits me again. I'm down to 23. We hit him again, and he dies. Throw my stone. Swing, swing, swing. Yeah, so if this wasn't like a super strong character, I would be kind of concerned to be fighting a Leopard Gecko so early. Although I'd probably be able to handle it. Alright, Poison Darts are on the ground. Uh, I'm not going to get into those right now, but I am going to say you should probably always pick those up in the early game. There's also a Ring Mail here. And this is where some interesting choices come into play, because a Ring Mail is a lighter kind of armor than Chain Mail. Uh, but, unfortunately... It's just, uh, <laughs> well, it'll give me more evasion, but unfortunately it won't give me as much AC. On this character, general rule of thumb, we're probably going to be wearing more or less the, the heaviest armor that we can find uh, up to a certain point. And I'll explain more later, but basically on this character, I suggest you don't wear a basic ring mail over chain mail. Just throw our rocks at this dude. He dies. Ah, here's an interesting enemy. So this enemy is kind of, uh, kind of BS in some ways, because while he's very slow, so we actually act faster than him, and we can see how slow if we want by doing the little trick, at symbol, question mark, dart slug in the chat. He's only speed 7, so we get more actions than he does. The other problem is that, um, actually no, this is a great thing to explain. So you'll notice he can bite for up to 3 damage. Seems easy, right? even though he has a nice fat 10 hit points, so what's so dangerous about him? Well, it's the fact that it possesses the following natural abilities. Slug Dart. At 7 is how many tiles away that he can uh, do it Do it from. It's red, so that means that he can definitely hit me right now if he wants to, if I remain in the same spot that I'm at. I can press... I can... Uh, hold on. I can press A from that screen to get a longer description. It just says, fires a dart of hardened uh, chitin, I think is how you say that word. And then the range, if you count the number of dashes in the arrow, that's how many tiles away from the monster, which is marked by a W, that he can hit. But it also just says 7 right there. Now, for reasons I cannot explain, uh, the devs just refuse to put the amount of damage that this kind of thing can do into the XV screen. So instead, we have to use this silly little bot, and uh, we get this nice wall of text. tells us some more info about him. And we see Slug Dart, and then in parentheses we see 2d4. So he can do, uh, it's just like D&D, &D, if you've ever played a tabletop game or anything like that, two dice uh, of four. So it rolls, it rolls one to four two times. Um, so it, it, what that means is it will do anywhere from two to eight damage to me, and it can do it at range. So the reason why this, why I kind of jokingly refer to this enemy as BS is because there are, there are starts that start with less than 8 hit points. And so if you just walk into one, he can instantly dart you and then you die. So 
What we're going to do, does GDR apply on dart? Um, yes, because it's not magic. So as a natural ability, I do believe guaranteed damage reduction applies. All right, so we're going to back off. This is how you want to deal with, generally, this is how you want to deal with ranged, ranged stuff that you're afraid of. This character isn't really afraid of him, but I'm just going to demonstrate the best practice anyway. So we're going to walk to the right. Now, if I look at him, I'm still within range. Why? Because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, he can shoot me from full line of sight. I'm going to take a step to the right. Luckily, he's quite slow. Step to the right, he can't see me. Just to make sure he's still following me, I'm actually going to press the dot key, which waits one turn. He shows up, take a step to the right, take a step down to the right, take a step down. And you'll get a, you'll get a uh, kind of a hang or, or a, a knack for exactly how this stuff works in terms of the line of sight. But basically what I'm doing is I am making sure that there is a wall between me and the slug. So I can't see him, and because line of sight is reciprocal, he can't see me. So he's not going to be able to shoot stuff at me. Uh, and now we're going to learn a new key. We're going to press T, and we're going to see that this is the shout list. Hello, rainy day tomorrow. Welcome to the stream. He can two-shot a squishy caster. He can one-shot one the right squishy caster. Uh, but yeah, we press the T key, and that brings up the shout menu. There's a bunch of stuff we can do with our allies, but what we really just want to do is get some attention. Um, and for some reason, uh, yeah, orders for allies, and then it says T shout above all that. We just want to press T again. So we press T twice and it says you shout for attention. We're going to do that again and again and again and again and again and again. It might take a little while. And there he is. All right. So this minimizes the number of turns that this lovely slug man um, can spend shooting his 2D, 2D4 damage darts right at my face. So now I'm going to walk up to him. He bites me and does no damage. We're going to swing on him, swing on him again, and he goes down. Very easy. The centaur with the acid wand. Don't, don't, don't suggest such a thing, Mr. Ostrom. I hope that doesn't happen. Arguably stone safer than shouting. Uh, are you suggesting throwing, throwing stones into the little gap of the, um, the hallway so that he would have heard it and other things maybe wouldn't? Because, um, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. I guess throwing a stone does make make noise, but I, I don't, I mean, in general, I wouldn't, if I was playing totally optimally, I wouldn't have shot it at all. I would have simply waited for the slug. And if, if for some reason he forgot that I was there, I would just find him again. Um, one stone for attention. He, I already had his attention is the thing. Uh, he already knew I was around, but sometimes, okay, so uh, hold on. Let me explain that in one second. Once I do this first, um, what I just did was I killed the slug, I, I gained a level, and I got to level 3. Every 3 levels, you get to choose an attribute to increase. On your uh, maybe, you pretty much want to choose strength every time. There are reasons to do other things, especially intelligence, but I'll explain that way, way later. For the most part, just pick strength. Alright, so I wanted to talk about stealth for a second because it came up. Um, why was I shouting? Okay, the, the slug had already seen me. There was no question mark over his head. There was no Z, you know, there was no collection of Zs over his head like he's sleeping. He knew I was there. He was, he was chasing me. He had this skill called stealth, which our Minotaur is not very good at with his negative one aptitude. The higher your stealth, and even if you have zero, it can trigger, but the higher your stealth, the more chance every time a monster is out of line of sight of you, they might forget you and then start wandering sort of randomly or in a different direction or away from you. Uh, also, it affects the chances of if they're in the line of sight, the chance of them noticing that you're there in the first place. Things are generally noticing that we're, we're there because number one, I don't have very much stealth. I have zero, in fact. And number two, I'm wearing heavy armor. But um, with that said, uh, there is a chance that he would have just wandered off. So... Um, Yeah, that's why I was shouting just for convenience. So he would definitely, you know, because if he had forgotten where I was and he hears my shouting, he'll come over to me. All right, let's press O. I see that there is a uh, hobgoblin. Now, again, the optimal thing is to pull him back and sort of fight him with the stones and then fight him one on one. Wow, that's hilarious. We auto-explored into a hobgoblin, 
and he immediately attacked us before I could do anything, which does happen sometimes whenever you move into the dark. Um, and he attacked and missed, and we killed him instantly with a headbutt. <laughs> and there's a cockroach, too. We'll just swing on him. All right, this is interesting. So you'll, uh, you'll notice... You'll notice that uh, something has happened. It says, Trog accepts your kill. That happens when you kill stuff. Mo most gods increase what's called piety. That's this bar right here. Uh, by killing stuff. And eventually, once you've killed enough stuff and gotten enough piety, your piety meter, the asterisk, will... Uh, you'll get more asterisks. So we went from one to two. And it says, you can now call upon Trog for regeneration and magic resistance. This is a hugely great ability. If I press A... We now see that in addition to the Berserk, if I were to press A, A, I'd Berserk. Now I could press A and then B to get Trog's Hand, which gives me a status effect that it gives me regeneration, so every turn I'm healing a little bit. Uh, more importantly, it increases my magic resistance. Uh, that's going to be super, super good for me. And I'll explain more about magic resistance later, but suffice to say it's really great. Um, there is a piety cost associated with this, so we cannot simply spam this like we can with Berserk if we were so inclined. There's also a failure chance associated with this. Berserk never fails. Trog's Hand can, um, especially if you have lower piety. Now, if I had more piety, that, fire ch that failure chance actually goes down. That's not necessarily the case for other god abilities, but for Trog, the only thing that matters is how much piety you have. So we're not going to bother with Trog's Hand unless we absolutely need it. Uh, and we don't need it right now, so let's keep auto-exploring. And then it says... What we've been looking for, we see done exploring. What that means is that um, the floor is fully explored, or at least the game thinks it is. Press it a few more times, it says done exploring every single time. All right, so look at our skills. We see everything's gone up a good bit. Remember how I mentioned my armor was going to go up by a point from 8 to 9? Looks like it has. I'm going to hold shift and press X which puts me here. This is called map mode. If I were to do X by itself, that would be the examination mode that I showed earlier. Instead, we're holding shift, we're pressing X, that puts us into map mode, zooms us out a little bit in the current version of the game, and we can press our directional keys to kind of get a look around this floor. Uh, I mean, you can look at the mini-map too, but this is kind of a nice way to, to zoom out and look at everything as well. Uh, and I'm going to look and I'm gonna see, well, there's a staircase here, there's a staircase here, there's a staircase here, although for some reason there's a goblin tile there, that's just a graphical glitch. Um, and then there's the exit of the dungeon here, which of course we don't want to leave through because then we'd be quitting the game. These little yellow asterisks at the top right of the staircases indicate that we haven't been up that staircase yet. I'm going to go over to this staircase, um, actually I'm going to go over to... I'm going to go over to this staircase. I'm choosing this one because it's the one with the most open tiles around it, so if I go down, and for whatever reason i got to go right back up because there's a bunch of stuff around me, I'm not going to get trapped when that stuff comes up with me. So we're going to hover our little... Hold on, I'm going to move this away because it's confusing. All right, we're going to hover our little thing right over the staircase. I'm going to press Enter. My guy cleanly auto-travels right to the staircase or wherever I wanted to go. A Another way to jump to a staircase that I believe Rainy Day Tomorrow is... Uh, yeah, there, there he is. He's saying exactly what I was about to get to. Um, go back into map mode. If you don't, if you don't want to manually navigate to it, instead you can press the left carrot. Actually, the, the carrot that's pointing right, the right carrot, I guess. And if I keep pressing that, it'll bounce me to all three different staircases, or the two other ones if you're already standing on a staircase. If I were to press the left carrot, it would show me upstairs. And of course, this is the first floor, so there's only one upstairs. Other floors, though, will have three downstairs and three upstairs and a certain number of hatches, and I'll explain about hatches later. Before I go downstairs, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, and just like in a browser, I am going to hold Control and F because I want to search, and it says, search for what? This is searching for items, okay? Uh, I can do things like I can search for all the items on dungeon floor one, so that would be D colon one. Or, for even more simplicity, I want to search for all the items on the floor that I'm currently inhabiting, which in this game is simply period. And it's going to show me all the stuff on the floor. I like to do this every time I finish a floor, because it tells me, you know, maybe I missed something, maybe I didn't. All right, well, it looks like I didn't miss anything of value, so I can ignore this. So we'll press escape. Another thing I want to do before I go downstairs, I want to look at the number of scrolls and potions that I picked up. 
So we have a three stack. Uh, and we have a two stack of potions. We have two sedimented purple potions. Now before you think that you can get, you know, cheeky or clever about this, uh, these descriptions change every single time that you start a game. So sedimented purple potions are not going to be, you know, cure, cure wounds or whatever every single time if you happen to see that that's what it is in one game. Uh, so unfortunately we're stuck playing the ID minigame. So how do we identify these? Well, uh, what we're going to do is we see we have a three stack. We're going to use that three stack or one of them and hope that it's identify. I have uh, certain things set up that automatically add this little prompt. Whenever I press, whenever I try to read a scroll, it says really read, and I have to press Y. But the default is that it would just get read. Okay, it says it's a scroll of enchant armor. I'd hoped for identify, but I won't say no to enchant armor. Now, when you read ID things, you know, that means that you're reading it to find out what it is. I can't go back and say, well, whoa, I don't want to read that yet. I want to save that for a better piece of armor. Can't do that. So we're forced to use it on what we've got. So I could just cancel, but it would just waste the scroll. So I might as well just press K. And now my chainmail uh, is plus one, and you'll see that my AC is now 10. On many characters, I would probably want to go ahead and enchant that armor, um, if only because having more benefit in the early game is really, really important. However, because the Berserker is so strong, I'm gonna save my scrolls. Um, now, the, the passageway between D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, like the early game is by far the hardest part of the game. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm also gonna drink one of these two stacks because any little bit of help I can get, maybe not on this character because it's a Minotaur, but on most characters, any little bit of help I can get is, is just gonna be crucial. So we're gonna drink this two stack. We press H, I press Y. It's a potion of heal wounds. So now we know for a fact We've got heal wounds in before mutation, Rainy Day says. Yeah, uh, there are mutation potions in this game, and boy, can they be dangerous. Um, but we didn't get one, so uh, joke's on you guys. But yeah, we got heal wounds. Heal wounds is really strong. Uh, if, we, if we look at heal wounds, I'm going to look it up just to make sure I'm not lying to you guys. Um, yeah, heals 10 plus 3d28 divided by 3 damage, so it'll heal at least 10 damage. Well... Actually, at least 11 damage, I guess. But potentially potentially more, potentially much more. Anywhere from 10 to maybe around 30-some, in my experience. How do you attack things, Mr. Streamer? Very... See, Tone here is a joker. I know he's not a beginner at DCSS. You just walk right into them, Tone, or you press tab. As you well know, my friend. All right, so we're gonna go down. So remember how in map mode, if I press, uh, if I hold shift, I hold X and I press the carrot, the right carrot, it shows me where the downstairs are. If I leave map mode and I press that same rightward carrot, I go downstairs. Alrighty, so um, we're on D2 and this is like essentially one of the worst things that could possibly happen. Um, if this was not, if this was not a Minotaur Berserker, <laughs> We'd be in a horrible place right now, just just, just absolutely miserable, and I'll explain why. So, you know, we see our little goblin with a club, whatever, we've seen him before. What's this, uh, what's this danger noodle here? What's, what's he doing? What's this green guy? He's an adder. So we look at him, it says a common dungeon snake, a species of troglodytic reptile commonly found in subterranean spaces. Max hit points 11, that's pretty good. Uh, really high evasion, which is very meaningful in the early game, but here's the kicker. He bites her up to five damage, he is fast, and he can cause poisoning. All right, so I look at the adder because I want to know how fast he actually is. He's speed 13, which is faster than anything we've seen yet. And he hits us for five damage, and then if he does hit us, if he does damage to us, he poisons for up to four to eight more damage. So imagine taking, uh, let's say five plus eight, 13 damage, six, seven, eight, yeah. Uh, per hit, and then he might hit you twice, 26 damage overall. That's one, one, one turn, he hits us twice, and gets a total of 26 damage in the worst case scenario. That's a huge, enormous, outrageous amount of damage for D2. Um, luckily, we're a big, strong Minotaur, and I guess this is why God invented Berserk. This is the perfect, like the poster, the poster child situation for using Berserk for a lot of reasons, and I'm gonna explain some of those reasons now. So first we're gonna do it, Berserk. 
You feel yourself moving faster, you feel mighty, you're feeling hungry. We swing, and we just immediately beat his ass. Down he goes. We kill the goblin. And so here's... If you want to be optimal, pull him upstairs first. I'm going to disagree with that. So, well, there are some situations where it would be bad. I'll explain that in a second. Anyway, anyway, um, so I'm berserking, and, and as you saw earlier, I can get paralyzed after I get done berserking, and I definitely will get slowed after I get done berserking. So we don't want to be caught down on this unexplored floor. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just hit the left carrot, hold shift and hit the left carrot, or the uh, comma key with, with shift held, um, and takes us upstairs. The berserk is still going. And then we'll just sort of, you know, press 5 so that the slow goes away. We automatically ate one of the five chunks of flesh. We're going to press five again so the, the berserk goes away. We only waited 13 turns because that's how long it took for that to go away. Um, Rainy Day was saying it would be more optimal to pull him up the stairs first. I assume you're saying that because the goblin would... Uh, we had to fight the goblin too. Personally, I think that killing the... I think that killing the adder and giving him less turns to attack me is, is the smarter thing in that situation because of how horrendously dangerous they are every single turn that they're attacking you. Although we have a lot of AC, so he was a little bit less dangerous than I was making him out to be. Alright, so we're going to go back down. And we see there's another adder. Oh god. Okay. Um, alrighty. So, ordinarily... If I was playing this character, like if I if I was if I was playing super optimally, or if I was playing a character that was just well and truly uh, not not super powerful, like this guy is, what we would do is we would move down to the right, we would go up the stairs, and we would try our luck at a different staircase. But because we on this guy are pretty much strong enough to eat adders for lunch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just duke it out with him. Um, so we have a little bit of range on him, even though he's quite fast. So I'm going to press F, right? And I could throw stones at him, which are quivered, but I don't want to throw those. We're going to use capital F instead. Hold shift, hit F. This gives us our little menu of things to throw. I would like to throw my poison darts at him. And why would I like to do that? Well, if you look, um, he's not resistant. Despite the fact that he's poisonous, he is not actually resistant to poison. So if I can get the poison to hit him, he's, he's having a rough time. Yeah, that's probably a rewalter down there, Mr. Alstrom. It could be something else, though. Could be Ashen Zari, I think. All right, the dart misses. This is determined by our throwing skill, which is zero, so this may not work. Oh, hey, he's poisoned. There we go. Okay. We went on to the staircase. We're going to do the dart. We're going to berserk. Kill him. Go up, just like we did before. And then rest. And then rest again. Let's grab this to scroll. Still no more two stacks. Alrighty, so a couple things on the ground here. There's a club, an adder corpse, goblin corpse will butcher all that, adder skeleton. There's a rapier, which is actually a very nice early game weapon. Like, really, really good, but it's in the short blades category, and we are pretty much married to axes at this point, so we're not going to fool with that. Uh, let's back up to our staircase. I want to see what this is. This is what you might call a vault, which is a sort of specialized part of the dungeon that is not procedurally generated, um, and instead it's just something someone made and it gets plonked down into the dungeon structure randomly. All right, we found our first altar, a very early, very early altar. So if I X over this, if I go into examination mode and I X over it, it says an opulent altar of Gozag. Press V. A glittering, golden, and bejeweled altar to Gozag Yim Sagaz, the greedy, gleaming brightly even in the dim dungeon light. Seems cool. Let's uh, go to it. And it says, it said, press uh, the same key that we used to go downstairs, the carrot, the right carrot, to learn more. You kneel at the altar of Gozag. So it says, um, Gozag, the greedy, teaches that the world belongs to the rich. He's, he's the god of capitalism, basically. So every time you kill something, it turns it into gold, and then you can use that gold um, to, to do stuff, um, to pray for certain effects. He doesn't actually have a piety system like most gods. This is my favorite god in the whole game. Uh, maybe I'm just a good capitalist, I don't know. 
but we can't join him because if we did, Trog would get real pissed at us. However, generally it's really, really cool when you find an ulti this early. On most characters, you don't start with a god. Uh, and the next, the next tutorial that I do, I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, choices of gods, what's optimal, what's fun, you know, um, because oftentimes what's fun is not necessarily what's optimal. Um, but this would be a great sign for a run if you found a god like that, um, because Go Gozag especially is just very, very strong. But sadly, we don't want to do that, because if we did that, Trog would start sending things to kill us, basically, and we don't have the power. We, we are not strong enough to survive God Wrath on this character. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy. This is a Sky Beast. He does 5 plus 7 electric damage. He's no joke. I'm going to swing. All right, this is a hatch that I'm standing on. This will take me, it says a spring-loaded one-way escape hatch set in the ceiling. It can be used as many times as you want, but when it goes up, what will happen is, I'll just show you. We'll go up. Yep. Takes me to a random spot. The same spot every time, but a random spot on the floor. You notice I'm not on a downstairs anymore. So we have him back on D1. So we're going to swing. Swing again. This guy goes invisible every once in a while. Uh, and he does a lot of damage when he attacks. So what we're going to do is because, you know, if we XV over him, it just says the floor, but we can kind of have an idea of where he is because there's this little silhouette. What we're going to do is we're going to back off. Now we don't know where he is. Just keep backing off. And he will eventually reappear. And then we swing on him. The reasoning behind me not just swinging while he's invisible, because I did know where he was, uh, is because, well, uh, you get less of a chance to hit when you can't see them. We keep swinging, and because I'm a big strong minotaur, my horns and my axe take his ass down. That was what was probably, you would probably be able to call that an out-of-depth monster. Um, a very powerful monster to show up on D2. Um, still only speed 10, so you can kite him as much as you want, um, but quite dangerous for your average guy. However, I'm a Minotaur, so I just smashed right through him. You'll notice that I leveled up not once, but twice, just from killing him. There's a wet spot on the floor. <laughs> yes, indeed. Alrighty, Dart Slug. Remember what I did before? I pull back, and then I wait. I didn't shout this time, just, you know, this floor is rather unexplored. I don't want to pull stuff to me. Just swing him. So I'm down, he dies. I'm actually pressing tab. This guy happens to have stones. Now, if I X over him, it will not tell me if he has stones or not. You just kind of have to know from the fact that they're throwing crap at you. So, so we saw that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to wait. Walk around here, wait for him, and go up and swing. You guys are talking about dark demon souls? Never actually played Demon Souls. This guy, he hasn't noticed me yet. We're going to throw something at him. He shouts, let's back off. Uh, he doesn't have any stones, let's just tap him. These guys are no longer risky at all for me to just sort of fight into or tab into. Um, there are sling bullets here. Ordinarily, I would pick those up and I would probably make some use out of this hunting sling. But I don't really need to on this character, so I'm just going to drop it at this point. There's a mace on the ground. It uses the maces and flail skill. Pretty decent weapon with a base damage of 8. For reference, my hand axe only has a base damage of 7. Technically, we could switch to that if I felt like it, but um, I'm happy with my mace for now. Something I'd like to talk about a little bit is something called cross-training. Um, if I train axes, I get a little less than half of that training devoted to maces and pole arms as well in what's known as cross-training. So it wouldn't be the end of the world if I found like a really good mace or a really good pole arm. I would actually be ready to use them immediately if I felt like it. Um, to explain a little more about what these skills do, um, basically every time you train a weapon skill, and I guess this is a good time to, to explain some of this, if you train the weapon skill, then your attack is faster and you do more damage and you're more accurate. Fighting also increases your accuracy and damage, but not as much. It also gives you more hit points. Uh, armor gives AC, as we discussed before, which is predicated upon what your base AC is, like how heavy of armor you're wearing. And dodging just straight up gives you a bonus to evasion. So we're building this character essentially as a combat monster. 
has a quarter staff on the ground, which is a pretty damn good weapon. I'm going to pick it up, but we probably aren't going to use it. We don't get cross training on staves. So, if this was a different character, if this guy wasn't a super strong Minotaur, you might see me seriously considering using that, using that staff. Aha! Something interesting. Okay, let me walk back over here. Again, I'm going into map mode to auto-travel here. So it says a ruined short sword. This could, could have a good enchantment on it. Could just be cursed. It's blue, so there's something going on here. Uh, I am not going to just wear it, though, because it could be cursed. It could be a distortion weapon, which I'll talk more about at some point later. We are going to pick it up, though. And I'm going to read my... Let's see, let's look at our scrolls. Every time you go downstairs, if you haven't identified all your stuff yet, you want to take a look. You want to say, well, did I... Did I get any more, you know, stacks of scrolls to, to figure out what's, uh, what's actually in my inventory? And we do have a two stack of unidentified scrolls. Supura Radu Sekwag. Let's use that one. You feel strangely unstable. It was a scroll of teleportation. This is a very common type of scroll, which is kind of your bread and butter for escaping horrific situations. Really, really useful, really, really useful kind of um, tool, but it's got to be used correctly. Um, after you use it, you'll get this telly effect. And after a few turns with this telly effect, three or more, one, two, three, you will go somewhere else on the floor, totally random. So you can imagine how dangerous that could be, especially on an unexplored floor. If you want to cancel that telly effect, you can actually just read another scroll. There are reasons that you might want to do that, but uh, that'll come up later. Alright, so we control F, we hit period, we're searching for all the stuff on the floor. We don't uh, see really anything that we need. We're going to take this downstairs. A frilled lizard, an adder, and a hobgoblin come into view. Okay. Um, note, you can also teleport like two tiles away. That's true. You can actually teleport and not move at all. It'll say your surroundings don't look very different at all or something like that. Uh, and, and it's just like, yeah, you teleported, but you didn't, you didn't move. So don't rely on teleport to actually take you out of uh, situations. Bolts if you want to be ambitious later. Yeah, I could possibly pick up the bolts. Then we can just go back for them. Anyway, so we have this adder here, we have the frilled lizard, we have the hobgoblin. I also need to be well aware of this, what's this bubblegum looking thing? Well, this is a relatively new addition to the game, which I personally think is a very bad mechanic, uh, but nobody listens to me. Uh, we have this dispersal trap, and if I, X, if I go into examination mode by pressing X and I look over at it, press V, nobody likes these, by the way, I'm not alone. Uh, it says anyone stepping on this trap will trans translocate themselves and anyone himself is that, a, is that a word and anyone else in view to a new location nearby hostile monsters may trigger this trap but your allies will avoid stepping on it so what that means is if anybody steps on that we play merry-go-round and just get like blinked all over the area like this adder goes somewhere this hobgoblin goes somewhere this newt goes somewhere and i go somewhere in line of sight it's very annoying but it's placed in such a way that i don't think anything will step on it so what we're going to do is we're just going to throw a dart at this adder, throw another dart, swing, swing. I'm not berserking because we're strong enough to fight these dudes now. I'm just going to melee all these guys. Ball pythons are pretty weak, by the way. Themselves is the more modern version. That's what I was thinking. All right. Uh, oh, this is an old, this is an old vault, which has kind of lost its... Uh, meaning over time. All right, so this vault placed, oh God, hold that thought. Alrighty, so I stepped up here and we ran into Sigmund. This is a, I'm very, very glad actually that he showed up because we've already been streaming for a little while. I might, I might stop the stream before too long. And I was really hoping that before I did that, we'd run into Sigmund. So in this game, you have your regular monsters, things like adders, things like goblins, things like, um, I don't know, kobolds, whatever. Uh, but then you also have uniques, and uniques are named, all right? So 
Sigmund, there's only one of him, and he may or may not show up in your game. This is a dude, all right, Sigmund, Sigmund the Dreaded, and he kills so many early game characters. So let's look and see what he can do. Sigmund the Dreaded, the elder pair of a pair of uh, brothers who came for the orb. No one knows what Sigmund saw in the dungeon to drive him mad, but his shrewd magical tactics and wicked scythe now leave little time for his victims to wonder. Despite his reputation as a vicious murderer, his grandiose and dramatic ways have earned him the admiration of many de denizens of the dungeon. If you run into this dude in the early game, on D3 for instance, it's very dangerous. It's not to say it's insurmountable, but if I was a character that wasn't a Minotaur Berserker, I would be very sad to meet him in, this, in the position that I'm in. In fact, I made a little bit of a mistake by walking in the way that I did. Uh, I probably should have hung out near the staircase and shouted a bit if I was playing super duper optimally. Anyway, uh, I'm a berserker, so I don't have to be that careful. So why is he so dangerous? Um, first of all, his base damage is 5. Not that good, but he has a scythe. And scythes, while they're really crappy because they're slow for the player, um, for the player they're very crappy. For a monster, they're nice because they do 14 damage. Um, so he can do... Right off the bat, you know that he can do 19, I guess, minus 2, so 17 damage with his weapon. But the real reason he's dangerous is because he has all these spells. His throw flame, according to the bot, can do up to, th to 15 damage. He can turn himself invisible, which is dangerous. He can cast Confuse on me, which makes me unable to control uh, my actions, which is ex extremely bad, uh, because he can just keep casting it on me. And if you look at this percentage... There's a 49% chance of that busting right through my magic resistance. Magic resistance is not something that you ever really have much of at this point in the game. And Sigmund shows up very early, very often. Uh, he also has magic dart, which, like throw flame, just does damage. And unlike throw flame, will always hit me if he casts it. I'm not sure how much damage that one does. Magic dart, 3d4, it can do up to 12 damage. Right, so if you see Sigmund early in the game, you really want to start thinking, well, what, what resources do I have to deal with this dude? Can I get away? Because every action I take runs the risk of him saying, well, okay, well, I'm going to confuse you, and then I'm very limited on what I can do after that. I can't, I can't walk around. Uh, well, I can walk around, but I might go in a direction I don't want to go. Uh, I, can't, I can't really... Um, well, I can drink a potion. I cannot read a scroll, I don't think. Uh, there's, there's just very limited in the kind of things you can do. So if I was going to be just incredibly, incredibly optimal right now, we would probably read a scroll of teleportation immediately because if he, if he confuses me, it's almost GG, you know? However, I have a certain special option available to me. I'm a Minotaur of Trog, and Trog means I have Trog's hand. So I do Trog's hand, and it says I have regen and MR++. So if I look, if I press that percentage button you know, shift five percentage. And I look, it actually says my MR has gone from no pips to two pips. My magic resistance is huge now. Now there's only a 2% chance of him confusing me, which is much, much better. Uh, I also have four potions and I have uh, heal wounds. So while this isn't exactly the most optimal thing to do, I think it is the flashiest and the most fun. We're gonna actually kill him. It's berserk. And we kill him in one hit. Get our strength. Swing on that cobalt. Now, what I just did here was not super. Like I said, it was not. It was not particularly optimal because uh, the berserk. Like he could have still. He could have still confused me, right? Two percent chance. And then after that, I don't have anything that cancels the the confusion. I don't have a cancellation potion. I don't have curing, which we'll talk about later. Um, so. I would have basically been, uh, excuse my French, but up shit's creek, basically, if I had been confused. Uh, I would have been stuck essentially trying to walk towards him to kill him, which probably still would have worked because, you know, I'm a minotaur. But uh, it would have possibly put me, sent me in the wrong direction. And I had a little bit more wiggle room because I could drink a potion of heal wounds, which would deal with some of the problem. Hey, that wasn't in French. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we took him. We took him down uh, and had fun doing it, but in general, you really got to take him seriously. Now, we were a little bit lucky insofar as his scythe is cursed today, so he does a little less damage with his melee. Uh, but he can spawn with enchanted size too, so it can be quite good. So, before 
Sigmund rudely interrupted me. I was saying that this is a, this is an old vault. So this is another altar to a different god. Zen, the lawgiver, he is, um, I guess you would say, good aligned and orderly aligned, which matters because uh, he hates certain other gods. Unlike most gods, Zen, as a good god, will not give you any kind of wrath if you abandon him, unless you abandon him and then worship an evil god or a chaotic god. Uh, and later on, I can talk about which gods qualify for those categories. Um, he He's a really powerful but kind of questionable in the early game kind of kind of god but we don't really need to think about which god to worship because we're stuck with trog we could abandon him but we would die almost instantly at this point in the game next to next to his altar there is a shop actually that's what this thing is called zen's purification station if we go in there there's actually a potion of curing uh there used to be potions of curing mutation and that's where the old old joke comes from i mentioned this is an old vault the joke is kind of ruined now because, well, potions of cure mutation don't exist. And um, the reason why they were in here is because Zen hates chaos and mutation is a form of chaos in this game. What we're going to do, though, is uh, the way we're getting into the shop is we're pressing the right carrot like we were going downstairs. All right. And we're going to press A because we actually want to purchase this potion of curing because, man, curing is a good resource to have. And we're going to uh, press enter. It says... Purchase items for 90 gold, yes, no. You have 96 gold pieces. After the purchase, you will have 6 gold pieces. Absolutely, I'll buy it. Now, curing was unknown to me. It said unknown, right? Now that I've bought that, it's identified. That's a different way of identifying potions and scrolls other than the identify scroll, which we haven't found yet. And it turns out we had a different potion of curing on our inventory already, and like I said, got identified. Now, curing heals significantly less hit points than heal wounds, maybe like eight. But more importantly, it cures poison, it cures disease, uh, it repairs a little bit of rotting, and it says clears the mind right here. Uh, and in retrospect, this would have been really useful against Sigmund, because if he had confused us, pop on a curing potion, and that just takes the confusion right off. Even though you're confused, you can still drink potions. So, pretty good. Now, I just pressed O a bunch of times. I kind of wanted to demonstrate that if you want to play this game super fast, you can. You know, I've taken like, God, like an hour and a half to do three floors, but to, if I was playing at my ordinary speed, we would probably be halfway through the dungeon by now, at least, you know, uh, especially on a combo like this. So you notice how quickly I can go through here if I just press O and tab. In fact, that's the joke is they'll call Minotaur Berserkers O tabbers. Um, this Quaka enemy is also fast. Um, you can think of him as basically just a reskinned Leopard Gecko. We're just going to tab him. He's, he's weak against... He's weak right now. Oh, this is interesting. Alright, so we're on D3, which is where things can get really dangerous. So, we walked up and we found this Orc. Max hit point 7, does 5 damage plus Flail. Flail is actually a pretty beefy weapon. He can do 15 minus 2, 13 damage total. And he was also throwing a boomerang at us, if you saw that little animation, which can do up to 6 damage. As a ranged weapon, it also gets his base damage added, so 5 plus 6 is 11, minus 2 for using a weapon is 9. He can do 9 damage per turn to us maximum at range. He throws a boomerang, hits me but does no damage, returns to the orc. Because he's got a ranged weapon, we're going to back off. But something I'd also like to point out is that orcs typically spawn in packs, right? And uh, sometimes, even this early in the game, it's not just regular orcs. There are these other enemies that come with them called orc priests and orc wizards. And they are, oh boy, horrifying at this point in the game for most characters to deal with. Um, so if you see an orc this early in the game, you really, really want to pull back. So I'm going to shout a bit, remember TT. And if he starts doing too much damage to me, I'm just going to chill right here. He can hit me with his boomerang as much as he wants. I'm just waiting with the period key. I'm just letting him come to me. It doesn't look like he has any buddies with him. So I'm going to walk up and take him out. But if something bad had started to happen, if a priest had showed up, who, by the way, can do 17 damage to you every single turn, uh, I would have just said bye and went up the stairs. Um, pulling things back to a staircase is super, super, super powerful in this game. One of the primary means um, of survival. 
I'm just tabbing these easy enemies. O tab, O tab, nothing really complicated. Wait a minute. Check this out. These are boots. So remember that capital W key for wear and comma for wearing something off the ground. We put on the boots. We see that our AC, let me take it off. Uh, I had 10 AC. I put these on. Now I have 11 AC. This also increases my what's considered to be my base AC. So my base AC from the chain mail is 8. I will actually add my boots, so my base AC is 9. And if you recall what that impacts is, how much armor skill I need to get free AC. So now every 2.44 armor skill, I am going to get a free point of AC from my skill. If I hit percentage to see my full inventory, I see that the boots are there now. I'm still missing an amulet, a ring, another ring, gloves, a cloak, and a shield if I want one. I'm also missing a hat, not a helmet, because of my horns I actually can't wear a helmet, I'm restricted only to hats. Other races oftentimes have other restrictions. There's a ring mail on the floor and a scale mail, those are both worse than chain mail, or at least lighter. This is another good god, the shining one. Um, like Zen, he will not mess with you if you abandon him, unless you worship an evil god. He's kind of like a paladin, I guess. Oh boy! So there was in fact a wizard. We auto explored and he immediately cast something on us. This is really very bad. Let's look at him. So they can have different spell books, but this one we see this one we see has a slow blink magic dart and haste. Um, sometimes they can have confuse in some things, but this one this one just says slow. So we're moving very slowly. Let me test something real quick. All right, so it's really bad, right? Because this wizard, he has these other spells too. Magic Dart is a, a way to do damage at range. So if I look up Orc Wizard, you know, we're looking at, uh, for the book that he has, 3d4, just like Sigmund, so up to 12 damage. And I'm moving slow, so he could do like 24 damage per turn to me. That's super bad. So here's what we're going to do. I want to cut the line of sight so he can't shoot me until he's close to me. And then I want to beat him up, right? So I'm going to move two squares up and to the right. Now, how do I know he won't be able to see me there? Uh, there's a little trick, okay? If I go into map mode, right, that's shift and X, and I go to the tile where I'm going to be, and then I press E, it places what's known as an exclusion. And that shows me what my line of sight is going to be when I get to that spot. And you'll notice Mr. Purple Robe Man, he's not there. He's, he's not in the red. I press it again, I press it another time, and then it's gone. I'm going to go up. I see there's actually two wizards. This is horrible. But we're going to cut line of sight immediately. Now these guys are not just going to forget that I exist. And the other wizard could very well spam confusion on me. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our resources. We have curing, so we can clear confusion. No big deal. Um, we have heal wounds. We have a lot of good resources. It's going to be hard for them to just straight up kill me. Oh, I did not mean to press 5. Whoops. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, I have my spacebar macro to my 5 key, and I just slammed my thumb on it. Uh, curing does not cure slow, it, slow, it cures uh, confusion. Anyway, what we're going to do, I, I just made a mistake. I, I accidentally rested is what I did, so they came right up to me. What I meant to do was do Trog's hand, so that I will be regenerating through this fight, and also so that uh, they're very unlikely to confuse me if the other one has that ability. Uh, now if this starts to go bad I can teleport I'm not going to berserk because he can blink and what blink does is it randomly translates the, translocates this caster a short distance which means he will appear somewhere else in the line of sight and if I'm berserked and he's far away from me that's very bad instead we're going to chuck needles at him potions of cancellation cure status effects that's correct particle face um, unfortunately we don't have any or at least any that are identified probably on any other character the optimal thing to do here would be to teleport but here i think we can just press the period key now we can x over this dude and we still know what his book is so that's the same one as before we're going to throw the dart at him throw the dart at him he blinks i'm going to press dot again and again and he's been dumb enough to come right up next to me. So boom, we swing. Boom, we swing. Trug's hand is fading, but 
We take his ass down. And the slow has run out. Trog appreciates you're killing a magic user because Trog hates magic. Um, so not only did he accept my kill, he appreciates killing a magic user. That means I got more piety than I ordinarily would have. His friends apparently never noticed me. So what we're going to do is we're going to shout on this staircase. Luckily his, his boys didn't come and get me. Alright, check it out. So this guy could have slow, he could have confused. There's three different books he could have, and we'll find out once he starts casting something. You know, if he casts Throw a Flame, we know he has one of these two books. If he casts slow, we know for sure he has only the first book. Um, he can't have more than one book, he only has one. Uh, if he has the Confused book, then that could be a problem. However, even while you're confused, there's a good chance of you going upstairs if you want to. So we're actually just going to wait here. We see that he cast Magic Dart, which does not narrow anything down. Kill his friend. We're just waiting. He comes next to me. Just wait for him. Actually, I could be throwing stuff at him. Swing. All right, so the reason I did it that way... I saved myself the piety of casting Trog's hand. Now, if if he, the, I would not have done that if I didn't have a staircase right here that I could sort of run, run up on, uh, or run away from him with, or these two potions of curing to really solve the situation. You know, these situations are only really dangerous for your average Joe. Yeah, berserkers generally do just kind of slaughter those guys, but believe me. Uh, if the RNG rolls poorly enough, those situations can be horrible. Alrighty, so I think this is a pretty good stopping point. Um, took a very long time, way longer than we ordinarily would have taken for a game like this, but uh, you know, we're trying to explain this from, from scratch. I think I did a decent job. If you have any questions, if you're watching this video later, later please feel free to drop any questions in the, in the comment box and I will definitely get back to you. Um, I'm running dungeoncrawlstonesoup.com now and this is going to be attached, this video series is going to be attached to a guide there uh, where I will explain things in depth, um, you know, in text for people who prefer it that way, but then there'll also be a link to the videos. So hopefully it helps some people. Um, this game has admittedly a huge, huge learning curve. Um, and so as a result, a lot of people take one look at it and then they just put it right down because, well, they don't want to fool with it. But, uh, you know, there's, there's some there's some magic happening here. You know, I mean, it's there's some interesting stuff. Some interesting stuff in the game. So, um, next stream when? I will be streaming tomorrow, I believe, at 6 p.m. EST. I'm gonna... I'm feeling motivated again to stream some DCSS now that I'm putting these guides together. So if you if you look for my streams, uh, my account name is Malcolm Rose Gaming on Twitch. So if you'd like to watch this live, then you can do that there. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream. Until next time, I'm signing out. Did you know that there are many ways that you can help support this channel? Read about them on rosecrypto.com support. At Rose Crypto, you can learn all about cool things like the Brave web browser, Bitcoin, and other cryptocurrencies. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.